Do you feel like there has to be something more? Maybe you are a follower of Jesus. You are doing your best to study the Bible, pray for God's direction and wisdom, but the cares of life and the frustrations of the day are weighing you down. Perhaps you are just beginning to consider the claims of Jesus because you sense that something is missing. You feel like you're made for more, but you don't know how to get there. Join us over the next six weeks as we walk through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, when we will all learn how we were made for more. Admiral William Perry was an English explorer of the Arctic. On one of his many expeditions to the Arctic, he and his men were trekking north over the ice to the North Pole. They stopped at one point, and he calculated their position using the stars. Then they pressed on, and after about three hours, uh, they, uh, uh, he stopped again. They were exhausted. And uh, again, he calculated uh, their location uh, using the stars, and he was shocked. They were further south than they were last time, he calculated. How could that be? I mean, it couldn't be his mistake. He was an expert on calculations using the, uh, the stars, and uh, um, he had written a book on the subject. He finally discovered what had happened. They were walking on a huge ice flow, moving south faster than they were walking north. It was the classic example, one step forward, two steps back. The ice flow was so big and moving so slowly that it was imperceptible to the eye until he calculated their position. While he thought he was gaining ground, he was actually losing ground. Maybe you identify. You're working hard, but you don't feel like you're getting ahead. Your vocational goals, your academic goals, maybe athletic goals, your financial goals, even retirement goals seem elusive. Maybe even your spiritual aspirations are, seem far from being realized. You've given your life to Christ. You tried to read the Bible every day. You pray every day. You try to pray through your day. Try to pray for people in your life. Try to pray for the president and our leaders. But you feel like you're made for more. But you don't know how to get there. You're trying hard, but you feel like you're not getting anywhere. Apostle Peter felt that way. There was something stirring within him, and he was never satisfied. Eat, sleep, work, conquer, repeat, day after day. His family was fine. His business was going well. He was successful. He was uh, well-liked and admired by people in the community. He was doing what he thought he would be doing as a boy. But somehow... He thought there must be more. What is my purpose? What should I be doing to make the biggest impact in the world? The longing for something more just kept eating at him. He was a driven man. He was used to facing challenges and then accomplishing them. But this one was getting away from him. He felt like he was stuck. He wondered if he would ever engage the mission God designed for him. Would he ever have the unique calling uh, to accomplish something, to make a difference in the world? It was a morning like any other. But on this morning, Jesus was walking along the shoreline. And he said to Peter, come and follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. He'd barely asked the question, and Peter said, yes, he was ready. And he left his fishing business and his supplies, and he went off to serve Jesus the rest of his life. He found that Jesus was the more that he was looking for. Maybe that's the answer for us. 
Maybe part of our problem is that we're working hard, but we're not relying on Jesus for His power. Maybe we need to move from more effort to more Jesus. Uh, We were made for more Jesus. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 in your Bible. If you want to use our Bibles under the chairs, it's on page 1173. Uh, The book to Ephesians is written by the Apostle Paul. Next to Jesus, Paul did more to increase faith in Christ from 10,000 in Jerusalem to something like 2 billion today than anybody else in the world. Although Ephesians is written to the people at Ephesus, it's unlike most of the other books in the New Testament that are written to address a particular problem in a particular place. This one's a general letter to all Christians in the world. It's sort of like the constitution of the Christian faith. Paul makes clear that growth in faith involves more Jesus. I read through the book and I counted 78 references to Jesus. In the first chapter alone, there are 25 references to Christ. So I want to read uh, the whole first chapter with you and um, just notice how many references there are to Christ. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. We got to put this up. Oh, okay, it's just not back there. All right, fine, good. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every special spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In Him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we who were first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better. (coughs) I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, And his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Clearly, we were made for more Jesus. Jesus is obviously central to Christian faith. I find in Ephesians 1, three ways we were made for more Jesus. One, we were made for more of Jesus' love. Read with me verses 4 to 8. In love, 
He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, <clears throat> the forgiveness of sins, and according with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. In love, he adopted us to be his children through Christ's death on the cross. Uh, Jory and I have five adopted children. <clears throat> we had four biological sons, and Jory said to me, I want a girl. I said, I don't think we make girls. So we looked to adoption. So now we have five adopted children. Adoption's a big deal in our family. Between 1854 and 1929, 200,000 orphans boarded trains <clears throat> on the East Coast <clears throat> of the United States and came west, stopping at cities where they could find families. These children would get out of the train. They would get in groups of about 40, and they would get out, and they'd stand on the train station, and prospective parents would look at them, examine them, ask them questions, check their medical records, even look at their teeth. The orphan train. Lee Nailing remembers the experience. He talks about it in his autobiography. He was in an orphanage for two years in New York, and uh, he uh, got on a train with his two younger brothers. Before they left, his father gave him a pink envelope with his address on it. He stuck it in his coat for safekeeping. They got on the train, and Lee began, he, he fell asleep. When he woke up, the letter, the envelope, was gone. I wish I could tell you that uh, his father spent all his resources on finding him, chasing him down, and showing up and saying, Hey, Lee, it's me, your dad. But that's not part of Lee's autobiography. But it is yours. Paul tells the Ephesian Christians, that God sent His Son to adopt you into His family. God loves you so much that He wants you in His family. Adopted children are chosen children. That's not always the case with biological children. When I was born, the nurse handed me to my father. He didn't have any exit option. He couldn't say, hey, this guy doesn't look so good. I want a better looking baby. They said, no way, take him, get out of here. If you were adopted, your parents chose you. In most cases, they went to a lot of trouble to make it happen. You object. Well, if they had known how I would turn out, I bet they wouldn't have made the same decision. My point exactly. God is omniscient. He knows exactly how you're going to turn out, but He chose you anyway. Things got worse for Lee Nailing before they got better. After losing his father's letter, the eight-year-old and his two brothers got on the train, and they went for six days, stopping at various towns, before his youngest brother was adopted. A couple days later, Lee and his next youngest brother were adopted. But that family soon, soon turned Lee uh, to, to another family. Next family was a farmer. And Lee from New York didn't know anything about farming. And uh, he, uh, he didn't know you're not supposed to open up the chicken coop, uh, you know, the door. And uh, when he did, the farmer was so angry, he got rid of him and sent him to another adoptive family. So here's Lee, living in an orphanage for two years, losing the letter, all contact with his father, losing his two brothers, being kicked out of two homes. His heart was broken. He was finally adopted by a tall man and a plump woman. 
And he had made up his mind that the next day he was going to leave. He was going to run away. He didn't want to have his heart broken anymore. The next day, they invited him down for breakfast. And uh, he reached for a biscuit. It was a breakfast of biscuits and gravy. He reached for a biscuit and... The woman says, no, not till we prayed. So let, me, let me just read you out of his autobiography. Mrs. Nayling stopped me. Not until we said grace, she explained. I watched as they bowed their heads. Mrs. Nayling began speaking softly to our father, thanking him for the food and the beautiful day. I knew enough about God to know that the woman's our father was the same one who was in the our father who art in heaven prayer that visiting preachers had recited over us at the orphanage. But I couldn't understand why she was talking to him as though he were sitting here with us, waiting for his share of the biscuits. I began to squirm in my chair. Then Mrs. Nailing thanked God for the privilege of raising a son. I stared as she began to smile. She was calling me a privilege. And Mr. Nailing must have agreed with her because he was beginning to smile too. For the first time since I'd boarded the train, I began to relax. A strange, warm feeling began to feel my aloneness, and I looked at the empty chair next to me. Maybe in some mysterious way, our father was seated there and was listening to the next softly spoken words. Help us make the right choices as we guide him and help him make the right choices too. Dig in, son, the man's voice startled me. I hadn't even noticed the amen. My mind had stopped at the choices part. As I heaped my plays, I thought about that. Hate and anger and running away had seemed to be my only choices, but maybe there were others. This Mr. Nailing didn't seem so bad, and this thing about having an Our Father to talk to shook me up a little. I ate in silence. After breakfast, as they walked me to the barbershop for a haircut, we stopped at each of the six houses on the way. Each time the Nailings introduced me as our new son. As we left the last house, I knew that at first light... The next day, I would not be running away. There was a hominess here that I'd never known before. At least I could choose to give it a try. And there was something else. Although I didn't know where Papa was or how I could write to him, I had the strong feeling that I had found not one, but two new fathers, and I could talk to both of them. And that's the way it turned out. God loves you so much. He sent his son to die on the cross so he could adopt you into his family. Just as Lee was adopted into his family, Jesus Christ came to adopt you. That's how much you know God loves you. Two, we may, were made to know more of Jesus' power. Read verses 15 and 16 with me. For this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Uh, Paul thanks God for the Ephesians and prays for them. We don't always know what to pray. In the movie Meet the Parents, uh, Ben Stiller flies to meet his girlfriend's parents. Uh, Robert De Niro is the girl's father, and he's an ex-CIA guy, and he's checking him out and running him through the ringer. And at opening dinner, he asks him to, to pray. Here's what happens. Good job, Buns. Hot patooties. Wow, Dina. Everything looks fabulous. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. It's such a treat for me to have a home-cooked meal like this. Dinner at my house usually consisted of everybody in the kitchen fighting over containers of Chinese food. Oh, you poor thing. What, there wasn't enough food to go around, Greg? No, there was. We just never really sat down like a family like this. Oh. Greg, would you like to say grace? Oh, uh, well, uh, Greg's Jewish dad. You know that. You're telling me the Jews don't pray, honey? Unless you have some objection. No, 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 I'd love to. Pam, come on, it's not like I'm a rabbi or something. I <laughs> said grace at many a dinner table. <laughs> it's... Okay. 
Oh, dear God, thank you. You are such a good God to us, a, a kind and gentle and accommodating God. And we thank you, oh, sweet, sweet Lord of hosts, <laughs> for the smorgasbord you have so aptly lain at our table this day and each day by day. Day by day, by day. Oh, dear Lord, three things we pray. To love thee more dearly, to see thee more clearly, to follow thee more nearly, day by day, by day. Amen. Amen. Oh, Greg, that was lovely. Thank you, Greg. That was interesting, too. <laughs> All right, so Ben Stiller has trouble knowing what to pray. What should we pray for? Here's what Paul prays. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as his mighty strength, he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Paul prays that we might know the tremendous power available to us in Christ. That power is demonstrated in two ways. Christ being raised from the dead and Christ being given authority over all spiritual forces of evil. Two powers that we can't overcome. Death and evil. Christ overcame them both. The same power that God used when He raised Christ from the dead is available to you and me. Paul says that Christ has power over all the spiritual forces of evil. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. He uses four Greek words that describe the hierarchy of demons who serve Satan. Though these forces are terrible, we don't need to worry about them because Christ is far more powerful. When I was a senior at Lewis and Clark College, my uh, philosophy of science uh, professor one day said, None of you still believe in demons, do you? He put it in the negative, slanted, so that anybody who said they did, you know, would look outright foolish. He stared at the class, daring anybody to raise their hand. Mine was the only one who met his challenge. He whirled around and said, What? Why do you believe in demons? I gulped. And I said, Jesus Christ, my final authority, talked more about demons than anyone else in the Bible. And when he was raised from the dead, which is the best attested historical event in ancient history, that showed that he was the Son of God. So I believe whatever he teaches... You see, that professor made the mistake of assuming that everybody has moved on from belief in spiritual forces of evil. Christ has been raised to a position above all forces of evil. We respect the power of the demonic, but we know that Christ, with Christ, we have victory over them. Experiencing more of Jesus... What God wants us to experience is not a matter of more effort, but more reliance on Jesus' power. We were made for more of Jesus' love. We were made for more of Jesus' power. And three, we were made for more of Jesus' ministry to the world. 
Paul ends chapter 1 with these verses. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Paul says the church, people who put their faith in Jesus Christ, are the body of Christ. Filled with the fullness of Christ, we are to touch every crook and cranny in this world. 1994, Jory and I flew to Washington, D.C. for the prayer breakfast, national. And the speaker that year was Mother Teresa. They had to put a little stool behind the lectern so she could be high enough so we could see her. She started out, she said, give me your unborn. Don't abort them. If you can't take care of them, give them to me. They're precious in the eyes of God. You see, 1994 was kind of at the height of the number of abortions in our country per year. Mother Teresa ministered to the sickest of the sick, the poorest of the poor, and the abandoned babies in Calcutta. She couldn't help everyone, but she could help some. You can't help everyone, but you can help some. And when you do, you serve Jesus. Paul says the church is to be the fullness of Jesus who fills everything in every way. Everything in all places around the world. Imagine that. Think of water filling an aquarium covering every thing in that tank. Paul says the church is to be like that, covering every need in the world. Sound impossible? That's because we tend to only think in terms of the physical world. Think of all the companies with the greatest impact in our world today. Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Ford Motor Company. Add together all their talent, all their expertise, all their capacity. Plus, put in all the other businesses in the United States. Multiply the aggregate by one million. Would that be enough to touch every crook and cranny in the world? Not a shot. But Paul tells us the church, with all its shortcomings, has that capacity. He tells us the church is the most powerful movement in the history of the world. Able to fill everything in every way throughout the world with the fullness of Christ. To fill every crook and cranny in the world with the fullness of Christ, we will need a paradigm shift in the church. In most churches, the idea is that people come to the church, pastors like Mike and me, we've got it all figured out. We know what the needs are. We make the the volunteer slots and we fit you in to serve our vision. We need to flip that paradigm the way Paul does here. We want to see the church more like an aircraft carrier where people come in to get refueled And we send them back out to fill every crook and cranny in the world with the fullness of Christ. We'll have to make our motto more like Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. Every time I've gone to Home Depot, I've been impressed with the staff. I come in with a home project that I probably don't know much about. Or a landscape project, and I don't know quite how to do it. I don't even know exactly what I need to buy. And they will take the time not only to help me find the stuff, but to help me think through what I need to do. You can do it. We can help. Typical church models are more like, we can do it. You can help. We the pastors, we we know what's going on. We've got the vision. You can help us. 
We want to spiritually refuel you and help you discover your gifts, passions, and story and send you out to touch the world. You're to meet the needs of people at your work, school, neighborhood, family, friends with the love of Christ. You share that Jesus is the only hope of the world. As we seek to get to know Jesus more and more and fully experience His fullness, then we can touch other people with this fullness. We were made for more in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul's words in Ephesians that we need more Jesus, move from more effort to more Jesus, relying on His love and His spiritual power so that we can be filled with His fullness to touch every part of this world, every person we see during the week. I want to give you a moment to pray right now. Tell Jesus if that's your desire that you want to know more of Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can invite Him right now to become your Lord. Adopt you into His family. Tell Him you want to experience more of Him this week. More of His love and His power and His fullness so you can make a difference in this world. You pray. Lord, we want to experience more of you, not more effort, but more reliance on you and your power and love, filled with your fullness this year, wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray.